Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Please sign up for my newsletter at zibbyowens.com for weekly updates about my podcasts, events, and more. Also, follow me on Instagram at zibbyowens and also at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. And finally, join my virtual book club called Zibby's Virtual Book Club, which meets every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time until 3 p.m. and features half an hour of book club discussion, followed by 30 minutes of Q&A with the author whose book we've just discussed. You can sign up on my website, zibbyowens.com, under the virtual book club section, or even on Instagram under the link in my bio. I hope you'll find me in all these different channels and enjoy this podcast. Hi, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but I have an anthology coming out called Moms Don't Have Time 2, a quarantine anthology. And it comes out on February 16th and has essays by 60 plus of the authors who have been on this podcast. So first of all, please pre-order this book. I think you will love it. I'm so excited about all the authors who are represented. Um, Just to give you a few, um, Chris Bajalian, uh, Jewel Parker Rhodes, Ashley Prentice Norton, Gretchen Rubin, Rima Zaman, Eileen Zimmerman, and that is just from the first page of the multi-page table of contents. So please pick up this book, Moms Don't Have Time To, a quarantine anthology. It's available anywhere you buy books, Amazon, bookshop.org, and your local independent bookstore. So please pick up a copy. And also, I want to invite you listeners to my um, fundraiser slash launch party the night it comes out on February 16th, a Tuesday at 7 p.m., Bookhampton and the Children's Museum of the East End are co-hosting it for me. And 50 of the authors who wrote essays in this book, as well as many of the amazing authors who blurbed this book, um, who wrote little praiseworthy quotes at at the front, will be there. And you can be there too. So if you go to my website, zibbyowens.com, and just click on Anthology and go to Book Tour, you will see um, a whole fundraiser section. And for $50, um, you can attend. You'll get a copy of the book, and you'll get to schmooze on Zoom with all of these amazing authors. This is like going to be the literary happening of February. So please come. I would love to see you all in person on Zoom, I guess, but even see some of your faces. I know so many of you are really loyal listeners, and that makes me really happy. All proceeds of the book and the fundraiser are going to the Susan Felice Owens Program for COVID-19 Vaccine Research at Mount Sinai Health System. And it is named after my husband's mother, who passed away from COVID over the summer, which many of you followed along on Instagram as I uh, recounted that horrific experience. So all the proceeds are going there. The cost includes the price of a book. So thank you for supporting this effort and for supporting my book. I can't wait to see you there. Today's episode has been sponsored by This Is Everything with Ali Levine, a podcast hosted by Hollywood mom, celebrity stylist, influencer, and Bravo reality star, Ali Levine. On her podcast, you'll get a mix of, well, everything from motherhood to fashion, lifestyle, spiritual being, all totally real and raw. You have to listen. Ali interviews celebrities, experts, entrepreneurs, and so much more. Tune in weekly to be uplifted, empowered, inspired, and truly entertained. Hi, everybody. Yesterday started our February book blast. Sometimes I end up with just so many amazing episodes that I have to release a whole bunch at once. So today is day two of the February book blast, and today is Nonfiction Tuesday. If you missed it, yesterday was Memoir Monday, and then we have Literary Fiction coming on Wednesday, New Novels Thursday, and Family Theme Memoirs on Friday. So stick with us for the whole week. Anna Malika Tubbs is the author of The Three Mothers, How the Mothers of Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and James Baldwin Shaped a Nation. She is a Cambridge PhD candidate in sociology, a Gates scholar, and the first partner of Stockton, California. After graduating Phi Beta Kappa from Stanford University with a BA in anthropology, Anna received a master's from the University of Cambridge in multidisciplinary gender studies. An educator, DEI consultant, and writer outside of the academy, she lives with her husband, the mayor of Stockton, Michael Tubbs, and their son, Michael Malachi. Welcome, Anna. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thank you for having me. It's really an honor. It's an honor to talk to you. You're such a genius. This book was like 
Amazing. Your book is called The Three Mothers, How the Mothers of Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and James Baldwin Shaped a Nation. Yes. Can you please tell listeners what this is about? Because even though this cover is amazing and the title is amazing, I still think it's about far more than just those women. This is essentially, the, well, you know what? I'll let you do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you were doing great. I was like, keep going. Yeah, no, it's about the mothers of Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and James Baldwin. Alberta King, Louise Little, and Bertus Baldwin were their names. But it's also about what they symbolize in terms of Black American womanhood throughout an entire century of American history and what they lived to witness, but also what they lived to inspire through not only raising their children, but also through their teachings outside of their families and their communities. And in the many ways that they still inspire us today, even though so many people don't know their names. So it's all about telling their story, taking them from the margins, putting them in the center, away from the shadows, into the spotlight like they deserve to be all along. It's amazing. But you also go back and give us so much rich history of so many places, people, generations. I mean, some of the things, even from something like Deal Island and how that started or how like the immigration from one country to another. And it's all like you painted such a picture of history in general. Like when I was reading it, I was thinking, okay, well, this is like the textbook. I mean, that sounds negative, <laughs> right? Because textbooks are terrible. But well, now I feel bad. If you're a textbook writer, I don't mean your book is terrible. I just mean it should be required. about this? They're not usually as readable. It's a little harder to get through them. Yes. Required reading on the history of Black America in general, especially from the lens of women. But still, it's like, it was just so you have so much information in here and yet you wove it together in a, in a narrative form to make it highly digestible. So I thought that was That was a big goal of mine. It was an important one. And I wanted it to be a text that people could refer to in terms of learning about American history through this perspective of three black mothers and how that changes the way we view events like the great depression, thinking about the great migration, actually getting to know participants in it, all of these things that we think about all the world, the both, both of the world wars, there's so many different things that they live to see, multiple different presidents and the way their policies affected them differently in each of the three cases because of their own access to resources and education. I think it allows you to better understand history. So I appreciate you taking note of that. Yeah, it's great. It's like people are always like, we should rewrite history and you did it. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And I like how you threw yourself in the mix. You know, another way that you made this book so relatable, like literally like starting by talking about whether or not you're getting your period. Like that is like, I'm like, oh, okay, wait a minute. This book is not what I thought it was going to be. Like she's open. Like the author is open and like talking to me like a friend. And now she's going to tell me a story and teach me. And it's like when a great teacher stands up, it's like, I don't know. And of course, that's probably what you're doing. You're getting your PhD and everything, right? So like, what is your... Are you trying to be a professor or what's the goal there? You know, it's so interesting when you said the comment about textbooks earlier, because I agree in many ways (laughs) (laughs) they can be a little boring is is the only thing. I definitely respect them for what they are and they're such important tools. And for all of my, you know, academic colleagues who do want to be professors right away, incredible. No, but for me, I'm actually not. I'm much more interested in public intellectual work. And that's why I wanted to produce a book that was very readable, very accessible, while also being a tool that could be used for education, but just in a way that's more fun and that you can connect with. And it feels personal because I believe that black feminist theory, gender theory, race, critical race theory, all were meant to help us better understand our world and to survive our world and change it. And it wasn't meant to be exclusive or kept within the academy, but I am grateful for my time in the academy. I am definitely a nerd. I love my degrees. I loved doing all the research to, to earn them but it isn't where I necessarily want to stay for now. I'm much more interested in talking to general audiences about what they think and contributing to current conversations because so much is happening so quickly. And sometimes when you're an academic and you're only talking to other academics, you feel like you're kind of missing out because it takes years to develop certain articles and get them published. And then it's only other academics who are reading them. And that's just not currently what I'm interested in doing. Maybe down the line, I would become a professor, but I love just talking to everybody about what they think. And that's what I'm most excited about with the book, seeing what all these different people get from it and what they gain from it. 
Oh my gosh, you're going to have the most amazing conversations. I mean, there's so <laughs> much in here. I was hoping I could just read this one point that I particularly loved. I mean, it's all the way at the end. I'm sorry, but it's part of our lives will not be erased. Yes. And you said, I cannot fully express just how much hurt and frustration the erasure and misrecognition of women and mothers, especially Black women and mothers, causes me. In my own life, I've experienced others demeaning me and questioning my abilities simply because I am a Black woman. How many times have men threatened my sense of safety, hollering at me from their cars? How many times have I heard I was only given an opportunity because of the color of my skin? How many times has another person's looks or comments tried to make me question my worth? I cannot say there have been too many. I'm reading one more paragraph. I can't stop. (laughs) Sorry. I also cannot tell you how many times people have been surprised by my intellect and my successes because they assume I am dumb and that my biggest accomplishment was marrying my husband. My own work has often been hidden behind his, not for lack of his appreciation, but because we still live in a world where women of color are not fully seen. And then you say, now that I'm a mother, this erasure takes place on new levels. I have stood at events right next to my husband while he was congratulated on the birth of his son. (laughs) And then you keep going on and on from there. But wow, that's super powerful stuff right there. That's amazing. Thank you. I think so many women relate to it and can feel, and I would love to hear your own experiences with that as well. But so often we're just, we're taken for granted, especially moms. It's this kind of weird balance of everyone expecting us to do everything and get everything done. If we don't, then we're blamed for it, but we're never thanked for being the ones who are running the operation in so many different ways. And of course that's different in different families, but in general, women are underappreciated. We see this in the way that we're treated and lack of safety and general toxic masculinity. So I think part of it was adding my own personal experience to that so that people understand why this book mattered so much to me, but also to be someone who's saying, I see you, I see all of us who are going through this. And I hope that this book can be a part of changing that. Even your dedication, I like started getting the chills. Like, wait, hold on, I have to read this too, and then I'll stop reading. And no, I love it. Talking. This is this is so fun. <laughs> <laughs> you said this is for all the mamas. You deserve respect, dignity, and recognition. I honor you. I celebrate you. I see you. So I don't know if you were talking to me. <laughs> but I took it. <laughs> yes, please do. Please I'm do. sure you were. T- I mean, perhaps you were. I mean, I know this is geared. Well, it's not geared towards black mothers, but it's mostly about getting the facts out into the world so that they are seen in a way that they have not been in the past. It truly is all for all the mamas though. And I actually define motherhood even more broadly than biological motherhood. It's like, you know, Patricia Hill Collins calls mother work, the kind of work we do that's caring for others, the way we're bringing others up, you know, teachers are doing mother work, doctors, nurses, so many of our essential workers. So it is definitely a celebration specifically of motherhood, very specifically of black motherhood, but also for all of those that are doing work on behalf of many and who feel unappreciated, feel unseen. And it's our time. We need people to give us the appreciation that we deserve. There is nothing that they're going to lose by giving credit where it's due. Oh, maybe there's some tie in here with my podcast. It's our time, you know, something. And I love how you say that because that's also also what I try to say about listening to this podcast because it's not, I don't mean just moms, like they're caretakers in so many ways, shape and form. And not that you even have to be a caretaker, but mom itself, the word is so limiting, whereas it's such a broad spectrum of people caring for others these days. And anyway, content is for whoever wants to ingest it. And I believe it'll find the right home. So (laughs) (laughs) I'm excited about that part of the conversation too. Just thinking of the different ways and the different mothers, this is especially common in black communities, communities of color, the mothers that you have even outside of your own moms, because of this, it takes a village to raise a child mentality and practice and tradition that is so beautiful and wonderful. And it's very kind of Western to do this as like an individual journey that everything falls on the one person and that they shouldn't ask for help or they shouldn't admit when something is is hard for them. Or, you know, even when we're having conversations about postpartum depression, so much of that can be avoided or helped and supported if we have more people around that kind of central figure. But also if we just see her, and in so many cases, it's going to be a woman who is not seen, who is not given the supports and resources that she needs, we can really change that and make it easier. And it's better for our kids and better for society. I'm all about the more you support women, the better society and communities do. So 
I also hope that it contributes <laughs> to that as well. I have a lot of goals for the book, so we'll see how many I accomplish. You should. You should. I believe it will accomplish a lot. <laughs> so let's talk about these three mothers in particular. You yeah. probably know more now about these women than anyone as you spell out so clearly that the, you know even things like the date that they were born is two different dates for certain of the women for their birth date and just yeah. so much conflicting yeah. research because they weren't even deemed worthy of recording in, in a way. Yeah. And you went and like must have torn apart every library and like every website looking for everything you uncovered. <laughs> Tell me, well, first I want to know about like your research and how you did that. But I really want to know, let's maybe let's talk about this first, if you don't mind. But these three women who went through so much and overcame so much. I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Yet they produced these leaders. So is there anything as a main takeaway for other mothers, if you want to raise a leader and someone who can speak their mind and affect change in society, is there anything you feel like they did that we can all do? Wow. There is so much that I could say to, to answer that question, because of course the book is filled with those lessons on how did they do it day to day with all of the challenges that they were facing but I would say something, even though, I mean, I like to celebrate their differences even more than what they had in common because of this notion that we try to categorize Black women as if we're all the same. And so a big part of the book is celebrating how different all three of the mother's approaches were to accomplishing something that, you know, in the end, we have these three incredible men, despite the many differences in their backgrounds. But one thing I think that they all had in common was this combination between both vulnerability and bravery and the way they saw themselves and what they were going to teach their children about themselves and how that allowed their kids to understand humanity better. So to break that down a little bit, so often moms feel that we have to kind of, I don't know, put on this brave face all the time. We can't let our kids see us cry or we can't let them see that we're struggling to do something because we feel like we have to be those superhero moms. But in all three of these cases, they were willing to say, Hey, this is difficult for me. You know, Alberta King was constantly, you know, worried about Martin Luther King Jr. Going out into the world. That was very real for her. That was her son still, you know, no matter what she wanted him to accomplish, no matter how much she had faith in what God's plan was for him. She worried about her baby. We see it with Burtis Baldwin. When she loses her own father, she cries in front of her son. She is able to show some of the things that are difficult for her. Louise Little, who I mean, again, like filled with examples of her showing that things could sometimes be very scary, but what do you do in those moments where you have sadness, where you have some fear, where you have some worry, you continue to push forward, you ask for help from others, you form communities around you, and they all were examples of that balance, vulnerability and strength, and being you know, this whole human being that I think allowed all three men to have a really deep understanding. One of the reasons they were all three incredible orators and organizers was they had an understanding of humanity that others did not. And I think a big part of that was that their moms were very willing to be honest with them about their own human condition. Okay. I can do that. <laughs> It's hard though. It really is. I mean, my son's still really young, so I'm not sure he's going to remember yet all of my own, you know, emotions and my journey of being his mother. But I think that honesty is crucial. And especially with sons, when they see women in their full humanity and true light, it can make them better human beings. It's great. Well, it's nothing like getting some parenting advice here. In the midst of <laughs> I mean, I need, I want all your parenting advice. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, if your kid has a rash, you can, I will know what it is. I have <laughs> four kids. I feel like I need to set up shop like a little corner in my pediatrician's office and just be like, why don't you just come through the triage center here? I will let you know what's going on and then you can leave. <laughs> that is hilarious. Yeah, that would be actually really effective, I think, for hospitals. Just have some moms sitting there ready right? to talk to new moms. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I should do that. I actually like I'm on the board of something called the Parenting Center at Mount Sinai Medical Center. And it, it's a lot of parent education and all that. But I've never thought about just plopping myself down one day and being like, all right, listen, <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you how it is. They're fine. <laughs> yeah, they're fine. I mean, my biggest parenting lesson that I feel like I probably say too much is that you don't have as much influence, I think, as you think you have. I mean, <laughs> I think that my kids, each one is born the way that they are. And they're also different. And you know, their genes may be the same gen generally, right? But they're completely different people. Yeah. And I just am here to sort of like 
watch them, you know, with my first kids, I was like, you know, on top of them, like, what are you doing? What are you doing? How can I make you better? You know, <laughs> and at this point, I'm just like, huh, look at this. You know, my son's like redesigning his room. How about that? You know, yeah, the creativity, <laughs> how wonderful. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So anyway, that's, that's actually even, I mean, to that point with these three moms, they had several other kids and we so often mm-hmm. only talk about their famous kids, but that's another really cool way to see even how they approach their different kids and their personalities and what they wanted to do with their lives. And I think we can gain a little bit from, from those lessons as well. There was this show that I used to watch and it was only on for like one or two seasons and then it was canceled. And now I'm going to forget the name again, something like Bob. And it was about when JFK and his brother, Bobby were boys Mm. and it was trying to show like, what did you see in them when they were boys? And it was a lot about their mom and how she was raising them. You should oh, try to like that. dig it. Yeah, yeah, it feels like it's up my alley. Yeah, it's real. It was so good. And I was like, I am, oh, it's called Jack and Bobby. And I am like the, feel like the only person who maybe watched it, but I think maybe I was pregnant. There's some reason I was home watching a lot of TV. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's worth, it's sort of the same theme. It's like, well, what was it in their childhood? I mean, that's not exactly what you were doing, but you know, it's always yeah. so interesting to look back and see, well, could this have been the influence? And what about this? And how did she handle that? And, or is it in spite of your parents that you end up becoming? Definitely. A that's a, definitely the case sometimes for sure. Well, go back to how you dug up all this information and wrote this book, especially you have your child, your son must be like, what, one and a half or something? Yeah. Now he's 15 months. Okay. It's like full on toddler mode. He's just running around and talking and has some Aww. declarative statements. We have no idea what he's saying, but he's really emphatic. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's a really cute stage. How did you do this whole book at the same yeah. time? And, or you must've done a lot of it before, but tell me about that. <laughs> yeah. I started the research before we were expecting my son and started with my PhD program, but definitely the journey of becoming a mother while, you know, moving through diff- the different stages and then having my son while I was editing the book gave me this very rich, deep personal connection to the three women that I'm really grateful for because motherhood can be an incredibly scary journey as much as it is really exciting, but especially for Black women in the United States and seeing what they were able to push through, but also the way they were able to transform their communities to better meet their needs brought me incredible inspiration. But in terms of the nitty gritty of actually finding all of this information around their lives, it was really hard. I say in the book that it was finding a needle in a haystack for every single, you know, even if you just take one paragraph, you'd have to break it down into almost like each sentence that I had to find a different fact in order to complete that one paragraph because information about them was so scattered. And then there were conflicting documents on, you know, what one person said versus another scholar versus, you know, all of these things, but that's what adds to the complexity of their humanity. And it's definitely a challenge that I appreciated, but what frustrated me most was how little there was out there because there's so much more about their lives that I think that I hope maybe the families will be more willing to speak about them now. One of the problems, maybe it's not a problem, but it's a challenge that they wanted to protect their moms. You know, these are three families who had been through so much scrutiny, so much inquisition from different sources, whether that was scholars or journalists, et cetera. And I definitely felt their need to kind of keep this person who was so important in their life guarded from that kind of scrutiny. And I am excited though now that they're able to see what the product was and what I wanted to do all along, that they feel proud of it and they're they're happy with what I was able to do, that hopefully that will allow us to hear even more stories about these three women. But so much of it was going through all of the men's works first, Then anything that people had written about the men, which there's like so much, (laughs) it's incredible. Every single year, there's a new book about one of these men, which I find incredibly brave by these writers because what else is there to say? It's like really, I don't know how how brave they are to go in and say, I have a whole new thing about these three men that we've already learned so much about, but there's nothing wrong with that. I just hope we can have multiple books about the moms as well. And taking them, like I said earlier, from the margins and bring them to the center. So if there was just like a small mention, I would take that. And I had to really like kind of go away from my computer. I had poster boards all over my walls with these like really huge timelines. And I was filling them in with post-it notes. And then I could see where I had really big gaps, which actually tended to be towards the beginning of the women's lives before they were married. You know, before a man made their life worth recording, really, unfortunately, that's kind of how 
it appeared and what it symbolized. And I had this huge gap between like, maybe they were born this year, but we know for sure they married their husband that year. And this is when they had their famous sons. So going back and filling that in with historical context and going really like on a deep dive into Grenada's history and Deal Island's history and Atlanta's history. So that's kind of how I just filled it all out and took little parts where other people had said, you know, like Maya Angelou had described Bertus Baldwin. So finding her name in one of Maya Angelou's speeches and, you know, learning that she was really short and that Maya Angelou had to bend to half her height to kiss her on the forehead. So that was kind of how it all came together. And then I called different historians around the country I was also able to work with some researchers at different sites who helped me find birth certificates and marriage certificates and doctor's notes, even from some scholars who studied the men and had just like archives that no one had asked to see before about the moms. And they just kind of shared those with me. So it was an incredible journey, really difficult, but also a really beautiful one at the same time. Wow. And a fabulous final product. Thank you. I feel like, and maybe this is already in the works, but Shouldn't this be like a three-part series on HBO or something like that? I would love that. I really would. (laughs) Um, There's definitely some interest in it. I do have a film and TV agent, so we will see how that goes. The way I kind of picture it is like, yeah, Netflix limited series, like maybe two episodes for each mom Mm -hmm. and just getting to better understand, again, what we were saying at the beginning, the context of U.S. history. Like that's the thing that really connects them because- all three of these moms never met each other. Right. Their sons would meet each other eventually, which I think is really a beautiful part of the book as well. But to see how something might happen nationally and then you get the scene through that mother's life, I think would be really beautiful. So we'll see what happens. Okay, fine. It won't be two parts. It won't be three parts. I'm, I'm, I've now expanded my order <laughs> to perhaps a six, seven, or eight part miniseries. Or even a musical. Anything. I think a musical would musical? be beautiful. Yes, like a Whoa. Hamilton, but you know, where the characters like actually people of color. So that would be cool. I miss the theater so much these days. Me too. Oh my gosh. I'm like, I didn't think I would miss it so much, but then when you uh, can't go, you're like, I want to go so badly. Right. (laughs) Anyway. Well, wow. That would be really interesting too. Well, so much you could do. I feel like I want to pause life right here for a minute, fast forward like 20 years and see (laughs) what you're doing because- Uh I feel like you're going to do really amazing things in the world for so many reasons. And I'm just like really excited just to like watch what, (laughs) how you end up using, harnessing your intellect and hard work and perspective and empathy, all of it combined to like affect change. That means the world to me, Zibi. I really appreciate that. And hopefully we'll have more conversations whenever, you know, 20 years from now we'll have another Yeah, so when you are whatever you want to be, whether you're the president or whatever, (laughs) what do you have like giant aspirations or or not really? You know, it's so crazy because in many ways I'm like living the dream that I've had for so long. I wanted to write books and travel and speak about them. The travel aspect is definitely being hindered by COVID right now, but that's okay. I'm getting to travel from my living room, which is a lot of fun. (laughs) But I really did just want to produce my writing. I do fiction and nonfiction. So my next one is going to be a novel that I'm finishing up and hopefully we'll be able to pitch this year. And just talking to people about it and getting everybody excited about things that can be complicated and theory that people feel maybe is overwhelming and that pushes, you know, them out of the conversation, but that actually brings them into a welcoming environment where we can sit and talk about things that are affecting us as a nation. And we'll see, maybe that turns into like a TV show at some point or I don't know. I'm excited to see, but it's fun. And, you know, hopefully maybe having some more kids. I think that's a huge part of my journey as well. And I don't know what the future holds, but I'm really enjoying the moment. This is where I've wanted to be for a long time. And I cannot believe the book is is now out. So exciting. Well, enjoy it. I didn't mean to not give this moment it's due. I was just like- No, I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm excited too to see what happens. (laughs) (laughs) What about you? Where do you want to be? I just want to keep doing more of what I'm doing. Like I want to just expand all the things I'm starting. And I don't know. I'm like, I just want to see where it all goes. It's such a good position to be in where you're like, I love this and let's just do more of this <laughs> on yes. bigger levels, bigger, bigger yes. scales. I could just like replicate myself. Yes. That would be it. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any advice for aspiring authors? 
Wow. Yeah. I mean, I think so for me, I always talk about the fact that it was not an easy journey necessarily. You know, I am young, but I also applied to PhD programs four times. Didn't really find where I wanted to be. Didn't get into all the programs I wanted to get into. It was really sad. And like every time I got these rejection letters, I was like, but everyone told me that I had done what I needed to do to like make it to the next step. And I've done all the work. And then it just was perfect where I ended up and being at Cambridge and having the support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and being able to complete my PhD within three years. You know, I had become really obsessed with like doing an American PhD program that was going to take me, you know, like seven years. And when I wasn't getting into those programs, felt really dejected and felt like maybe I was not understanding what I was supposed to be doing with my life. And then now, you know, fast forward to finally getting into a perfect program and having my book out. So you just have to really like push forward past those rejection letters. There's going to be so many of them, you know, even if you want to not necessarily, I mean, self-publishing is a different route, but if you want to work with an agent and you want to, you know, get a book deal, some agents aren't going to work with you. They're not even going to reply to your query letter, but you'll find the ones who believe in you. And then from there, it's just the ball just keeps rolling. So it's probably very cliche. I think everybody says this and it's so much easier said when you've accomplished the thing than when you're in the middle of the struggle, but definitely from somebody who received a lot of rejection letters and who at times felt like maybe I wasn't doing what I really in my heart felt I was supposed to be doing just to keep pushing, but also being understanding with yourself. And then with the novel that I'm hoping to pitch this year, I've been writing it for like four years. So it's a long long process. And I remember other writers telling me that at the beginning and I didn't really believe them. I was like, sure, you maybe had to wait that long, but I'm going to have this book out so much sooner. And I'm on like my sixth round of edits and it's getting closer and closer each time, but it is a journey. So just kind of stick with it if you really love it. And it's definitely worth it once you're able to, to show the world your work. Perfect. Great. Well, Anna, thank you so much. Thanks for coming on the show and thank thanks you for, for having an amazing me. book and all of what you have to teach in so many different ways. Thank you so much, Livy. I really appreciate the time. Okay. Take care. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Today's episode has been sponsored by This Is Everything, the podcast by Ali Levine. And just a reminder again, please pre-order a copy of my book, Moms Don't Have Time To, a quarantine anthology, and go to my website under the anthology tab for the fundraiser, and I hope you'll buy a ticket and join me for, and I should have mentioned um, all proceeds go to COVID-19 research. So please join me for the fundraiser. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time To Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 